understand what the Lord told me. The anthem is such a great thing to, to have, to be able to proclaim out loud our faith in song and in great joy. So it is truly a blessing. I encourage you now to consider the word of the Lord out of John chapter 20. I believe it is important that we always take time to exalt the word of God. We live in a day and age that more and more is lessening its value, while certainly ignoring its authority. And therefore, it is important for us to consider that it is given as not only revelation, meaning a revealing of who God is, but it is telling us a story. It is God's story. And it's important that we understand and read its various parts. So here we read John 20, starting at verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran, went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. And Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. And the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbanon, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, you are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness for many, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. 
Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord, and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing, you may have life in his name. Blessed Father, we bow before you. We bow before the truth of your word. And we realize and we understand only because your spirit has opened our eyes. That you are not dead. But that you are alive. That you conquered death first by dying. And then in the mighty power of God, be resurrected in life. And here lies our hope. Here lies our promise. Assured to us, because you have spoken it so. Lord God, I pray with all my heart that all of us here would cling to that hope, would cling to that promise. And as Jesus said, that we would not disbelieve, but rather that because of you, because of your word, we would believe. We would exalt, we would celebrate the name of Christ. Thank you, Father God, for taking the initiative. Thank you, God, for understanding and knowing in all that is to be known before the foundation of the world. know our need. And you would have a plan. And out of your great riches and out of your great love, you would execute that plan for us. What amazing love. Father, we pray that in this life, as we await our promise, that we would understand that the gospel is not only for our eternal tomorrow, it is to help us and enable us to overcome the evil of the day. Whether it's our own selfishness or the struggle and sins of others around us. That we can in fact live this life today in your glorious grace. And we can offer your love and offer your grace to others. If for no other reason than in worship of you and gratitude to you for all that you have done for us. With this in mind, Father, we collectively pray for Eric. Lord God, I pray for Eric Olson, and I pray that you will sustain his faith. It is a young faith, but it is a growing faith, and we praise you for that. We pray, O oh God, that you will sustain him in all that he faces in the days to come. That you would help him, yes, replace physical things that were lost in the fire. But above all else, that you would just continue to help him see that you are, in fact, with him even when it doesn't always feel that way. Father, I continue to pray for Julie Barber and her family, and not only for the loss of her grandfather, but that does have a significant impact on them as a whole family, but just on the many struggles, especially John's health, and just ongoing needs there. Lord, may your hand rest on them as a family. May answers be provided where there are still questions. And give them strength. Give Julie strength of faith as she seeks to encourage her children. Father, we pray for Jill, Janice, Harvey, the entire family. It has been a long road, not only because of the amazing depth of grief and loss, but also because of the necessary realities of our culture, the reality of a trial, 
which unfortunately kept a lot of wounds strong and open. So, Father, we pray for this Friday that your hand of mercy would be upon the family. Strengthen them, we pray. Encourage them with its closure. Father, we pray for Bill Holcomb's sister, Debbie. We're glad that she's doing better. We pray that that will continue to move in a positive direction. We continue to pray for Dottie's story and her body and strength. That you will just help Alex to know how best to serve his family. Continue to protect and watch over Abel. As his system is oftentimes in a compromised condition. Father, right now we just want to pray for literally all around the world. In all time zones. In all nations. For this is a day that Christendom celebrates. And so therefore, Father, for every church that is truly your church for every believer that is truly yours we pray for not only the exultant worship of the resurrection but we also pray father for the seeds and the fruit that may be at least planted and has started today or continued today or even reaped today lord god May your spirit move all around the world. We are grateful to you. And we pray that in our daily lives we would show that, if through nothing else, then through a growing desire and action of obedience. For you are God, mighty to save. We give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Next two uh, songs uh, focus on uh, death, but the victory uh, over death. And uh, I'm going through the First Corinthians 15. It says, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in the first song, See What a Morning, the third verse has uh, a part here that relates to that scripture passage. It says in that last part of verse 3, we are raised with him. Death is dead. Life has won. Christ has conquered. And we shall reign with him, for he lives. Christ is risen from the dead. Join us, give praise to our risen Savior.
is we sing the power of the cross.
say that whenever I'm going through the sermon series, that it just so happens that whenever I'm going through fix the holiday, well, that's just frosty in the cake for me. So here we go. Open your Bibles to Ephesians. While I'm sure I'm not saying anything new for most of you at least, the Christian faith is so extraordinary. And quite frankly, it's extremely countercultural, especially to a culture that prides itself on seemingly fact, science, and a healthy disregard for the supernatural. The world determines that the beliefs of religion, of Jesus, crucifixion, and of course, most certainly resurrection, are full of fable, misguided trust, and basically it's simply a way to cope with life, but not very reliable or full of substance. I really want you to, to think about that. That is the world you and I live in. So while we may not live in a country that does not allow us or forbids us to do what we're doing, we do live in a country that at the very least mocks or thinks very little of what we're sitting here this morning expressing faith in. And therefore, especially for our youth, for our children, for each and every generation, there is that added challenge telling us our faith is empty, telling us our faith is misguided or foolish. But friends, I would, I would say this, I believe that the truth is the Christian faith, based upon the Bible, is in fact a direct challenge to the human centrality of our world, and therefore poses the really hard question. What belief structure provides real substantial answers to what happens after death? What or who decides the quality of our eternal future? Because I will tell you, I have studied philosophy. I have gone through enough science, even if I barely passed, to understand that none of that offers any more of a substantial answer than what the Christian faith might pose. So it's, it's important to ask, is it science? Is it economics? Is it humanism? Is it Islam? Is it sexuality? Or could it be that the extraordinary belief in Jesus the resurrected Christ might actually provide a better answer? Join me as we pray. Father, to study your word, to explore your word, to consider your word and what it says immediately brings us to the crossroad of one of two things. To disbelieve or to believe. To accept it as fable and legend or to accept it as truth and authority. But also, if it is truth, it's full of hope. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to navigate these words, to navigate your truth, and that your spirit would help us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're in Ephesians, we're going to chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And you, so remember, Paul is writing a letter to the church. And as I had mentioned the first time when we started even this whole study in Ephesians, I said, Imagine a group of people that you know and care about, and they're going through a variety of things, and you want to write a letter to them, because you know you won't be able to go see them yourself, so you wouldn't be able to actually say what you want to say, offer the encouragement you want to offer, what would you write? This is what Paul wrote. Please do not miss the fact that this is a personally written letter to people he knows and cares about. 
And so he's talking to them and he says, verse chapter two, verse one, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So last week, I already covered the first three verses, but a quick review. Paul makes it crystal clear that the church, the believers of the church, were once, past tense, walking dead, verses 1 through 3. Even as Paul is reminding them of the problem that we needed salvation from or out of, Paul also keeps them hopeful. He reminds them, you once walked, you once lived. This is what you used to be. And he's very clear, we all, all humanity, once lived in devotion to the prince of the air, the passions of our flesh, living just like everyone else does in the world. Self-determination, self-glory, self-love, self above all, including, especially, concerning God. For that is the essence of sin. Self over God. Self knows better. Self is equal to God. And so, therefore, that self-focus makes us dead to God. Walking dead in everyday life, especially in all our relationships, with God and with people, that's what sin does. We are walking dead, practicing dead, no life whatsoever, no real sense of love, no real sense of giving selflessly, sacrificially, because the centrality of sin is self. And that selfishness, that sin, makes us dead to God. And as I said last week, if God is the defining of all loving grace, mercy, care, patience, all of it, then if we're dead to God, we're dead to all that is good. And it has a huge impact on relationships. Don't get me wrong, the taint of sin, as I mentioned Friday night and last Sunday, goes very deep, it covers everything, it infects everything. The wage of sin is death, decay, dying. That's especially true for relationships. Here's a question, what did that look like in Paul's day? I am a strong advocate that when you read the Word of God, the first place your head should go is, what is this saying to the first readers? So what did that look like in Paul's day? Well, we know historically it's well documented. Obviously, that's easy for me to say, and the only way for you to prove or disprove it would be to go look it up yourself. <laughs> Not that any of you would. DJ would. DJ would look it up. He would double-check me, which I was always grateful for. So what did it look like? Roman culture embraced, actually, the supernatural. I want you to think about that for a second. We don't get that. Ancient culture, it was never, ever, never an issue of whether they believed in deities or not. You would not go to somebody in the cafe in Rome and talk, start talking about your belief in God and hear someone go, God, you believe in a God? They would have said, what God? 
Consider the difference. Consider that reality. They believed in the supernatural. They had no problem with that. They had no problem with the idea of miracles, angels, demons. All of it was on the table. Okay. They also believed it was, uh, Rome believed it was the supreme thinking culture. All right. They believed that they were the culture of the universe. And therefore, whatever was Roman, here's what's funny about Rome. They stole a ton of culture from other cultures. Rome had very little that was actually its own. Don't know why, that's just the way it ended up working out. So Rome thought they were the supreme thinking culture. They were obviously far advanced, way beyond the barbarian, the Egyptian, and most certainly the backwater area of Israel and anything east. Now, there was some truth to that. Uh, Roman roads, Roman military, Roman metallurgy. I mean, Rome was far ahead of the game in a lot of areas. But once again, a lot of that was because they stole enough from others that they could spend their time elsewhere. Here's the thing. The Roman culture was very open and loose with things like sex, leisure, political intrigue, and all-around morals. It was a culture that encouraged self-centered living. So I, I caution the, us, for one thing, when we keep saying it just can't get any worse. Well, friends, it was worse, or was at least just as bad. Rome is actually the one culture politically, um, on paper, that would have looked a whole lot... It, Rome today would look very similar to us in terms of the way it approached living. Rich poor, slave free, law, and corruption. Rome wouldn't have to change a lot to basically adapt to our culture. Today, we live in the only superpower country for democracy, at least on paper. We live in a country that urges people to buy, eat, express whatever they feel, whenever they feel it, and more and more, however they feel it. We live in a culture that encourages the, what is your truth, above any other idea of truth. And just like Rome, sex is a self-indulgent thing, rather than a relational thing. Identity is not defined by any social or familial or biological structures. Rather, identity is based more on feeling. It is a culture that is reacting to hurts, slights, and perceptions of not getting what is owed or de deserved. In other words, we live in a culture that not only allows, but encourages self-gratification, self-indulgence, and if necessary, throwing a random tantrum until you get what you want. People insist that their way of thinking, their ideals, are most important and therefore should come before anyone else's. You see, it's not necessarily that people think that your ideals aren't important, they're just not as important as mine. So in a culture that's supposedly saying, just accept my ideal, what they're really saying is, make sure my ideal comes before yours. But if everyone's saying that, how does that work? Well, look around our country. That's how well it works. The interesting thing is the brilliant stroke of the Prince of the Air in this particular time period has been to generate enough parental, political, religious, and marital failures of leadership to help validate much of the hurt and distrust we see people reacting to today. This way of living is just as much an illusion as anything Rome offered and is just as full of walking dead as the era of Rome had. In other words, just as Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. The way of people is sin. It is self-indulgent, and it is anti-God. So my point is this. Whatever Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, 
is just as applicable to today's culture as it was to the Roman culture that they lived in at the time. One of the most amazing realities of the truth of God is that it is timeless, cultureless, and not bound by anything except God himself. Therefore, because of that, all people, according to the scriptures, born under what the Bible calls the curse of sin, all people are objects of God's wrath. And when the end comes, all people will suffer the consequence of sin, which is physical death, eternal death, separation from God. That is the curse. That is the wage. This is why so many people feel like there is no more to life but just can't figure out why that feeling is there and, and what's the answer. What will fill it? What will make me feel better today? And so we spend a lot of hours, money, and time trying to figure it out. This is why so many people seek meaning and control by finding answers with philosophy, science, wealth, children, sex, pleasure, food, on and on the list goes. And yet... People keep falling short because life is just ash. Life is empty. If you're walking dead. Everyone, every single person I have ever met feels this lack. Feels this sense of there's more, but I can't seem to find it. And everyone is reacting to it, and everyone has their own way of dealing with it. So friends, please do not miss the fact that no one can escape the feelings of illusion, emptiness, and despair. Why? Because death is not only their end, death is their present. They are walking dead, and this is the life of sin. This is the reality Paul is trying to make sure the church remembers so that when he gets to verse 4, we are thinking about the significant depth of our problem. We are feeling the reality of being walking dead. <clears throat> then Paul says in verse 4, but God. Two of the most important words ever stated in Scripture. But God, the only hope, the only answer to the life the scripture describes as walking dead is, but God. Only God can do something about all humanity's deadness, friends. God's divine intervention was always part of the plan. Always the direction of the revelation of who he is and what he would do to not only show his glory, but the totality of his greatness for all eternity through the simple reality of, but God. That was always part of the plan. We can ask all we want, why did he do it this way? I don't know about you, but right now I'm just glad he is doing it this way. I am so glad that in the foundation of the world as he was creating, he understood how it would all unfold, and he understood that we could do nothing to change it, that we would stay in our deadness unless but God. Unless he steps in and takes the initiative, we're done. Therefore, it begs the question, why? Why would he do this? Why would he care? Verse 4 then goes on. But God, who being, so you know I love those words, being, it's the state of being, it's the state of who he is, God, who being rich. I understand that the United States culture understands rich better than most cultures do, but let's just make sure. Rich implies not lacking, not barely having enough, but actually it's implying bottomless. But God, who being rich in mercy. And he goes on to say, and having a great love. But it's the last part that should just grip our souls for us. 
but God taking the initiative in our deadness, but God being rich in mercy and a great love for us. Psalm 103, verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Titus 3, 4, and 5, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. God's very character, God's very essence is just exploding with mercy and just full of a love that is immeasurable and great, and it's for us. In the testimony that we read in John when he says to Thomas, blessed are you, you know, because you've seen and you believe, but how much more blessed are those who believe and yet who have not seen it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible simply because that's one of the few times that we can definitively say Jesus was talking about you and me. Because I haven't seen it. But I believe. And I believe because he is rich in mercy and great in love for me. For you. God could have stood on the sidelines. God could have created and abandoned. God could have done so many other things. But if he did, it wouldn't have fit who he is. Because the very essence of who he is, is mercy, is love. He would never create and not care. And we need to rest in that, take confidence in that. So I have a... Hogan gives you gives me gave me a, a multi-part sentence, so I'm going to give it to you in chunks, kind of like I did for Fred the other day. So here we go. First of all, God's revealed love establishes His commitment to bless us in Christ. So th that is the that is the foundation keystone. It is His love that sets the platform, and that love is a demonstrated commitment. How did He demonstrate His love toward us? While that we were yet sinners, he did what? He died for us. Meaning, the definition of love, it's a lot of things when it comes to God. And you can read 1 Corinthians 13. But the key element of God's love compared to our love is that it is self-sacrificial rather than self-centered. And Jesus, with a great love, loves us. And that love is a commitment to then bless us forever in Christ. That then, next part, then out of his love, his revealed mercy withholds the punishment we deserve. And, and how did he withhold it? Because he placed it upon Christ. The fullness, the friends, I, 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 I wish I could more tangibly impress this upon your hearts and minds. I, I have plenty of pastor friends we talk about many of the struggles of the church in general. And one of the most commonalities of the church is that when the chips are down and when things are rough, we truly believe life it has, it has more punishment. And I understand, I am sympathetic to why we do that. But if I can as lovingly, bluntly tell you, it is this. We mock the cross when we do that. Because Jesus took the fullness of punishment for us. That's what part of the cross is. It is paying the debt we owe, but the fullness of judgment and punishment is now taken upon Christ. So I understand that life might be hard. I understand that there are things that will happen in life that we don't understand. But if you believe in Christ, let me just plead with you. Don't fall to the trap of the temptation to say God's punishing me. No, he already did that and Jesus took it. Don't ever lose sight of that. Don't let the enemy whisper your ear and go, God is angry with you and he's punishing you. Because if that were true, then the cross is empty. 
Don't let Satan fool you. So out of his great love is the established commitment to bless us. And out of that love, God reveals his mercy by withholding the punishment we deserve and placing it upon Christ. Then also out of his love, his revealed grace gives us the generous gift of life and the means to live for him in Christ. So we have God's love revealed. We have his mercy revealed and we have his grace revealed. That grace gives us life. So the very death that we keep tasting and feeling empty now is no longer there because of grace. And lastly, out of his love, there is a revealed kindness where God gives the compassion to care enough about us that he sent Christ to become one of us, die for us. starts with his love, it, it then produces or, or expresses itself in mercy, grace, and kindness. And in all this, friends, God acts because he is the definition of mercy, because he has a great love that he actively loves us with, and therefore he does something for us. Here it is. Even though our deadness makes us enemies towards God, makes us objects of God's wrath, God steps in. He takes action because he has an eternal plan for us that takes us out of our deadness and makes us alive in Christ rather than dead in sin. That's the hope of verse 5. Paul saying you once were walking dead. Now, in grace, mercy, in love, in kindness, you are alive in Christ. And Paul ends that thought with an all-encompassing truth that it is grace that brings about salvation. What is grace? Well, let me put it this way. Our deadness deserves wrath and eternal judgment. That's what we deserve. Grace steps in. God aims his mercy and love toward us and makes us alive in Christ. But here's where grace really shows itself. God doesn't expect us to follow ritual or law to fix things, but instead his grace steps in and makes our payment for the wages of sin is death to enable us to be right with him. So mercy, God's mercy withholds something that we deserve. Grace gives us something we don't deserve. Both of them in Christ. In Christ who receives our punishment and debt, grace, the payment is made once and for all. How we can actually be alive. If you remember that in chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, Paul is praying that we, the church, the saints, would know the surety of the immeasurable great power of God, which he aims at us. And then Paul says it's the same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead and place him at the right hand of the Father. Now remember what I told you. We study the trees to understand the forest. Don't lose sight that these phrases, these ideas, these truths are all interlinked. So here we go in chapter 2, verse 6 then. Paul tells us how that power that he was talking about, praying about in chapter 1, 19 and 20, is at work in us. What does he mean that we would understand the original great power that he aims towards us? Okay, and he says it's the same power that he raised Jesus from the dead and ascended him. How does it work in us? Here we go. God's power is to make us who were dead now alive. Raised up with Christ from death to life and seated with him in the heavenly places. That is how the power of God is at work in us. 
the way Paul phrases it, he wants us to understand it as a completed reality. Obviously, we understand that there's still the struggle of flesh now. But yet, he wants us to understand our place in glory, in the heavenly places, is already established and secure. You can't out sin God's grace. But yet the beautiful part is God's grace, mercy, and love are at work in you, which we'll get to next week, to, to make us want him more than ourselves. But it is a completed thing. His power that is aimed at us has made us alive. We are, we are completed action, resurrected with Christ, in Christ. We are ascended to the glorious heavenly places with God, seating next to Jesus who is sitting next to God. Because it is a done thing. Paul is trying to encourage the church to hold tightly to this because Paul knows life is hard. Paul knows that on any given day, hell can come to the believer. Merkel says it this way, there is a clear parallel between what God did in Christ and what he does in a Christian. I want you to really think about that. The great immeasurable power of God at work in us was the same power at work to raise Christ from the dead and ascend him to the right hand. The parallels are huge. So please understand this is both a promise of the inheritance spoken of in chapter 1, 13, and 14, but it is also of the truth that we are no longer dead to God. Meaning, it's not just that I'm no longer walking dead. I am no longer dead to God. I can actually now know God personally. Because in our deadness, that couldn't happen. But because I'm now made alive in Christ, God can interact with me. He can interact with you. Because our sin is forgiven. Our sin has been paid. Our union with Christ, while most certainly includes our future physical resurrection, so please understand that. It is absolutely a, a central part of the promise that we will be physically resurrected, but it is also the key foundation to our new life in Christ right now. A life focused on God, obeying God, just as Christ did. Because we're no longer dead. Instead, we have new spiritual life in Christ. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Romans 6. Friends, this truth, this relationship reveals both now and the ages to come how great and measurable are the riches of his grace toward us. In other words, what Paul really is trying to underline with huge highlighter or sharpie marker or whatever it is you use, he is saying it's personal. But it's also meant to reveal in exaltation the fullness of his glory. But what's amazing is he exalts it, he shows it through us. Yes, imperfect us. And I don't get that. But it's personal. This letter is as much written to you because of your faith in Jesus as it is written to anyone in Ephesus. Do not miss the fact that Paul was writing to you. gospel was always meant to be personal. But remember what I said last week, if you were here, if not, sorry, you can watch it on YouTube. We cannot understand or know the depth of the riches of God's grace unless we consider the, the 
deep uh, meditation, at least somewhere in the camp of our sin, the evil of our hearts. When we actually give ourselves permission to do that, it then helps us see how immeasurable God's grace truly is. And it's in that that glory, God's glory will shine forever. Colkin said it this way, the purpose of God's great plan is to bring everything together under Christ for the church is now revealed. All mysteries are solved. All steps and pieces of what God's doing is now known. Let me put it this way. This isn't just about fixing what is broke, but it's about the huge truth that God is and will be lavishing us with kindness and grace and love for all eternity. Yes, it is about fixing what is broke, but it's more than that. It's an opportunity like any... I almost hate to use this example because there are too many people, unfortunately, that do understand this. They've never had this. So understand it in its best ideal. Like any truly loving, good, able father would. The fullness of the gospel in all of his riches of mercy, grace, and love and kindness. He's just bursting with the opportunity and desire to do it. He is just bursting with the desire to lavish. He is building a kingdom centered around, founded on Christ. And as I've already mentioned in the last past few weeks, we are the beneficiaries of it. That's inheritance. But we are also God's inheritance as well. How about that? As I close, how how truly incredible all of this truly is. You know, I have no idea if this stirs you at all. And I, I'm actually not talking about what I'm doing up here or saying. I'm talking about the essence of the reality of the gospel. I have no idea how much it stirs you. If you have believed since you were little, if you have grown up under these types of things and celebrated uh, almost every Easter that you are alive, does it feel dull or worn out to you? I, I always wrestle with the tension of what Peter says in Second Peter where I, I don't ever want to try to emotionally stir you because that's not my goal. But I do believe it's part of my calling, as Peter said, to remind you and to press upon you what this is. And so I would simply caution you, if this is dull to you, I don't mean the sermon. I don't care about that. But if the, the premise of the personal nature of Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 is dull to you, I would urge you, go home, get in the closet, and cry out to God that he would help change that. Because this needs to stir us. Paul wrote verses, chapter 2, 1 through 10, for a reason. Because he knows how easy it is for the gospel to become, I dare say, home drum. I have it. Okay, great. But see, that just shows that we don't understand or grasp that the gospel is digging into our souls every day. Help us every day. Make us hopeful every day. Fill us with love for God and others every day. To actually explode out of us over time the love, mercy, kindness, grace of God out of us every day. And I'll prove that point next week. <laughs> Friends, this is so personal. It's at least meant to be. The hope and promise of the resurrection of Jesus, what we are celebrating today, the ascension of Jesus, is that both our resurrection and ascension is assured as well as revealed in Christ. That's why we're supposed to celebrate. 
Celebration helps us remember, and remembering helps us understand the promise is real. We aren't celebrating a God that's dead, and then Paul says, hey, believe in a resurrection. How empty would that be? It's because Christ is dead, resurrected, and ascended that we can then gather and do what we're doing. That, if nothing else, is why it should stir us. I can face today, we can face today, we can overcome our sin and the sin of one another and the sin of the world, not in our own strength or understanding, but in Christ. What Christ has done, what Christ has endured, and what Christ has overcome. Do you understand that Christ did not overcome the grave in his own power? Do you get that? He is our example from beginning to end, from the time he is born to the time that he dies to the time that he's resurrected. All of it in the power of God the Father. All of it. Because Christ wanted to show us that's how it is for us. It's personal. For it is God's power at work, and it is God's loving grace that is at work in us, for us, toward us. And it makes me ask over and over again, what loving grace is this? It is given so freely that an object of wrath such as myself, a self-centered man, would know such love, such care, such grace and mercy from the one being who actually deserves unwavering loyalty and devotion, but instead gives to me all that I do not deserve and pays for all that I do deserve so that I do not have to suffer it. What amazing love is this? So it is my prayer that the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus becomes something we proclaim to our souls and hearts daily. Being reminded of what God did in Christ, what Christ endured, what God endured, so that we could know eternal life and abundant life. That we would bring these truths to our minds when we are in fear. That we would bring these truths when we are feeling something about a person or moment. That we would bring these truths to our minds when we engage our minds and mouths with people closest to us. When we are tempted to choose self over God and others because Christ gave himself so we could be free from sin's death. Yes. But also from sin's oppressive weight. That's part of what Jesus meant when he said, my burden is light. Yes, living enslaved to Christ and righteousness isn't easy because of our flesh. But with that being said, A, God gives us everything we need to do it. And B, it's a whole lot lighter than living enslaved. Your sin simply eats at us and destroys our very soul. But we must choose to remember, to proclaim the gospel to ourselves, to remind ourselves that sin does not need to win. Because in fact, sin has already lost. Why? Because death is dead. On Friday, we celebrated and reminded ourselves that the answer to death was death. Jesus died. But that's just the first half. The second half is that in God's power, there is resurrection to life. And the second, the second Jesus rose, death dies. And God has the victory. And he passes all the benefits of victory to us. So my prayer is that we keep asking ourselves what loving grace is this? Blessed Father, may the hope and the truth, the joy, the peace, of all the benefits of victory 
sink deep into our hearts and minds. May we truly grasp and hold tightly to the overwhelming depths of power of your love that you have aimed toward us. That we would understand how very personal you intend the gospel to be. So Lord, dig deep. In your spirit, help us hold truth. And be filled with all hope. In the name of Jesus. out for you. Yet yeah, not I, but Christ, <clears throat> but through Christ in you. Think about what was just said. The first part of that first verse says, what gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There's no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. Stand and join me as we sing. <clears throat>
Else we learn indicatives of the gospel joyously motivate us to obey the imperatives as we submit to the transformation into greater Christ likeness, humbly receiving the gifting and calling God gives each of us to empower us to faithfully serve his kingdom. This is why Paul wrote Ephesians to the Ephesian church. He taught them the truths of the gospel. So that they would then understand that the commands were given for a reason. Because the commands are meant to help us express and exalt the gospel by demonstrating to a lost, selfish world what obedience looks like. And it is in living that way that we then are transformed more and more into a Christ-likeness that is beyond imagined. All of that is being done to empower us to join God in his labor to build his kingdom. It all has a purpose. It all has a point. But it starts with us hearing, believing, embracing the biblical truth of the gospel. and Letting it dig deep into our everyday living. So that we go from being walking dead alive in Christ. Resurrection Sunday is to celebrate that you are no longer walking dead, but with Christ, you are alive. Hallelujah. It is not only that he is risen, he is risen indeed. God's church is risen. It is risen indeed. It is that thought I hope you take home. I'm going to ask Jill, Janice, and Harvey and his family to come up here. This, for any of you who may or may not know, Jake, if you want to bring um, one up there. Joel, and Jim, if you want to come here. Listen, this has been quite the last few months. There is nothing that anyone can really say to unexpected tragedy. It looks different in a variety of ways. For death does come to us all, sometimes quicker, sooner than we would have thought or imagined. The past August, tragically, Harvey, Jim's mom, and DJ were taken home. Unfortunately, they were also taken home, not just simply uh, because of something like illness or something along those lines. It was done through the negligence, unfortunately, of another person. Because we live in the society we live in, that requires, appropriately speaking, law, trial. And the journey of this trial has kept the wound and reality of two beloved people's passing fresh on the hearts and minds, especially of the family. By God's grace, things hopefully come to a close this Friday. There will be a sentence that is passed down. The family will be there. The family will have an opportunity to speak, primarily through Jill. That's, this is probably one of the main reasons we're doing what we're doing right now, is that for all of them here right now, 
they go to a final step in terms of the court side, the, the trial side of this journey. And so we are coveting, we are asking for the church family to be in prayer for them through this week, but then especially Friday morning, and then in particular as Jill will be reading a statement to the one who caused all this and how that all plays out. So we are just asking, we are going to be offering prayer on their behalf. As we pray over them in preparation for this. So please join me as we pray. Blessed Father, we are, we are grateful for life. We are grateful for the amazing lives of two that were dearly loved, but especially by this family. And while we have to, we have to celebrate the truth that they are with you, and give thanks for that. We also cry out to you in sorrow. For it was not expected and it most certainly wasn't wanted. Not to happen this way or in this time. So Father, it has been a very stressful and heart-wrenching few months for a variety of reasons. But this trial has kept the wounds fresh memories plain and clear. We are grateful that that particular chapter is on the way of being closed. So Father, it is my prayer for Janice and Chad, Renee, for Harvey and his wife and children, and for Jill, that you would strengthen their hearts and minds through this week, that you would help prepare them and the strength of soul, heart, and mind to step into the court on Friday to face the accused, to speak their hearts and minds to the accused, quite frankly, to trust a secular court. As you, I pray, would bring closure to this particular part of the journey. Strengthen them, Father. Help them to place their hope in the only thing that is substantial enough to help them, and that is in you. Resurrection promise is not only already received by BJ and Jill's mom, but it is promised to each of them to endure this coming moment. So, Father, I am thankful for them, for their testimony for their journey through this challenging time. So help them to the finish line, we pray. We lift this all up to you in the name of Jesus, as a family of Christ, as a family of believers together with them. The body of Christ, united in heart, said, Amen. Have a wonderful Easter week. Enjoy time with family and friends. Have a great week.